Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break and uh, you are now feeling uh, woken up after the coffee so that we can start, we can continue our um, workshop going into the, a bit deeper in the contents of the, of the project. So now, as, as we heard this morning uh, from Andrea Prota, we will change, slightly change uh, our program. We will have, uh, uh, before lunch, uh, the presentation of uh, um, Julia Faga about uh, the bulletins of the roadmap project. Then we will have uh, Claudia Morsut presenting the thematic papers. And uh, Daniela Di Bucci, uh, she, the, she will present the, it, the vision paper that we produce in the roadmap project. After that, uh, we will have a presentation on, on the uh, advisory group by Domingo Javier Viegas. Uh, and, the, and we will go deeper into the, advisor, the role uh, of the advisory group. And then we will have the, the, the lunch break. And we will restart with Tiago Rodriguez and the, with the rest of the project and the discussion. So uh, I would like now to ask uh, Julia Faga to uh, come and present the bulletins of, uh, 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 that were developed during the project. Thank Good morning, everybody. I am, uh, ah. <laughs> I am Julia Faga, a researcher at the uh, Centre Foundation that is part of uh, C3R. And uh, uh, I am, the, in the Roadmap Project, I am the person in charge of the uh, design and publication of uh, bulletins. And in this presentation, I will show you the, uh, the workflow that led to the creation and publication of bulletin with uh, the related problems and uh, future developments. Uh, one of the main goals of the, of the roadmap project is to collect, analyze, and review good practices, recommendations, lessons learned in disaster risk uh, management. Uh, and uh, to achieve this goal, various actions have been implemented, uh, in particular uh, for our side uh, uh, with the bulletins. The bulletins, uh, in particular, are the results of the constant scanning of good practices in uh, disaster risk management. Uh, the bulletin uh, in the project were conceived as a uh, brief documents, a few pages documents, uh, with a bimonthly publica uh, publication that uh, uh, are addressed to um, decision makers, which uh, had to report the results of an initial selection of uh, good practices. Uh, in each publication, uh, we try to uh, collect uh, good practices in a, uh, relating to a, a management of an emergency in a multi-risk perspective. And uh, we have not focused on a single phase of the cycle, but we try to uh, analyze all the phases of the, of the cycle. The main structure uh, of the bulletins is composed by a uh, first part dedicated to the project and uh, its uh, developments, uh, followed by uh, a section dedicated to the, the topic of the bulletin and the good practices selected, and a uh, last part dedicated to the disaster risk management initiatives and, uh, and news. 
uh, each uh, uh, bulletin is identified by a DOI and uh, is uh, accessible uh, at the, uh, on the Roadmap Project uh, website uh, in, at the page uh, publication. Um, considering that uh, bulletins uh, are very frequent and uh, uh, that is not uh, really easy to, to find good practices, uh, the, the definition of the topics uh, in the project wa uh, was made in the early stages of the, of the project and we tried to select a topic that uh, take into consideration current uh, issues uh, like, uh, uh, as you can see, the impact of the pandemic on emergency management, forest fire emergency management and associated risk, <coughs> management of floods and landslide, management of volcanic eruption and associated risk, uh, climate change and food supply, industrial accident and environmental uh, pollution. Uh, while <coughs> the first and the last uh, bulletin uh, are dedicated to the, the project. Uh, but what was the, uh, the procedure for the selection of, uh, of data? Uh, the problem of this type of selection is that uh, um, disaster risk management uh, good practices are not uh, really easy to, to find and uh, even when available are available in a non structured form. So uh, we in the, uh, in the first phases uh, of the project uh, try to understand how uh, to make this selection and uh, um, where to find the relevant information. Uh, scientific papers, scientific reports, uh, civil protection protocols, uh, humanitarian networks, governance website were the starting point of this uh, uh, selection. And in fact, uh, they allowed us to learn about uh, tools, uh, websites, research projects, and documents that contain possible good practices. Uh, once found them, uh, we try to make uh, a selection of uh, good practices chosen. Those are already validated and tested throughout uh, exercise or emergencies. Um, or emergency. The, um, uh, for the reasons mentioned uh, before, uh, the bulletins uh, uh, not include uh, uh, all uh, the um, good practices selected, but uh, include uh, the abstracts and references uh, of the documents in which uh, the good practices uh, uh, can, be, can be found. Uh, in this slide, in the uh, following slide, uh, I will briefly show you the, uh, the main data of uh, each uh, bulletin. The first and the last, uh, as I said before, uh, is dedicate, are dedicated to the, the project. In the first bulletin, we uh, presented the, the project, uh, the outcome, the expected impacts, the consortium, the, the committee, and so on. In the last, we will present the results of the project with the, the, con the conclusion of, uh, uh, of this uh, these days of this workshop. The second bulletin is dedicated to the impact of the pandemics on emergency, on emergency management. We, um, we choose this, uh, this topic because COVID forced the world to uh, manage multi-risk events. In fact, uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, many events occurred uh, together with COVID, like floods, earthquake, uh, landslide, or explosion, uh, and uh, events uh, related to climate change events. <coughs> uh, the, main source of data are uh, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent and Societies uh, with the report on Be Beirut explosion or uh, the United Nations for Disaster Risk Reduction <coughs> report on Zagreb earthquake, the American Red Cross Memorandum for Preparing for Disaster uh, During COVID and the Italian Civil Protection Department update of the intervention protocol for uh, managing uh, other emergencies in connection with the COVID emergency. 
The third bulletin is dedicated to forest fire emergency management and associated risk. Uh, the main source of data are um, European Commission report, national uh, report, and uh, um, good practices uh, uh, selected and tested in research project. The same is for the four bulletin uh, that is dedicated uh, on the management of floods and landslide uh, risk. The fifth bulletin is dedicated to management of volcanic eruption and associated risk. And the main source of data uh, are uh, the uh, international uh, association report or guideline uh, like uh, USGS, Japan Meteorological Agency, UNESCO report, and uh, um, research project like uh, Fut Future Revolk uh, project, and exercise, uh, national exercise like the Italian Civil Protection Department exercise on Campi Flegrei. Uh, the sixth bulletin is dedicated to climate change and food supply. Uh, on this topic, we uh, have found a lot of materials, uh, many materials, and uh, the, the main source of data uh, are World Bank, uh, FAO, uh, Report Guideline, uh, National uh, Institutional uh, Guideline, agency, uh, International Agency Guideline, and, and so on. The seventh bulletin is dedicated to the management of an industrial accident and environmental pollution. And the main source of data are the United Nations report, European Commission report or guideline, um, uh, different research projects with uh, good practices and, and so on. Um, as, a, as a first uh, consideration, we could say that for a certain topic and certain phases, <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of materials, uh, while for uh, others uh, uh, topic, uh, it's very difficult to find good practices. During this project, we ran into several issues, uh, like uh, um, the between uh, the uh, sorry the difference between good practices, lesson learned, and recommendation. Uh, <laughs> In fact, it's not uh, really easy to understand what is what. <laughs> the, another issue is the terminology. Uh, we have noticed that uh, uh, there is not a common disaster risk management or disaster risk reduction terminology. Um, another one is how to organize the material. In fact, uh, heterogeneous information sources need to be uh, joined together, I think. Another important issue is the lack of ex post report. Uh, in fact, uh, only few agencies in the field provide this type of information, but uh, in our opinion, this type of information is very useful for this type of uh, uh, project and uh, team. Uh, uh, the last two are connected and uh, are how to reach the audience and how to share the materials. Uh, in fact, uh, local disaster managers often are not reached by this type of publication, and in the project we uh, try to uh, understand how to share this type of materials. The future developments uh, uh, obviously derive from uh, the issues encountered. Uh, and in our opinion, we should try to uh, define the difference, uh, try to define uh, the difference between good practices, lesson learned, and recommendation. Try to define a common terminology. Uh, this is a, a huge uh, challenge. And uh, try, uh, try to create uh, a single point uh, of access to share uh, this type of information. Uh, and uh, uh, try to reach the audience, uh, the audiences, uh, uh, maybe with the translation of the products into multiple languages. And uh, finally, uh, we uh, should try to uh, better involve the uh, decision makers in this type of, uh, of research. 
with this, uh, I have concluded my presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, very clear presentation and a lot of fruitful uh, those, uh, issues to be discussed and to be thought through. Uh, and I hope in this afternoon we will also have the opportunity to exchange on, uh, on the findings of, uh, uh, that were presented. Now it's my pleasure to pass the forward to Claudia Morsut from the University of Savanger to present us the uh, thematic papers. If I'm not mistaken, yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, I'm here today uh, representing the University of Stavanger, uh, which is, I hope, uh, or has been a very valuable partner in this amazing consortium of Roadmap. I am an associate professor in uh, international relations, and I'm actually working in a very much uh, interdisciplinary research group within uh, societal security and risk uh, management. And today I'm here um, to, to present not, not so much the content of these uh, uh, thematic papers, but rather the process uh, behind these thematic papers. And you will see very soon that um, the thematic papers share uh, the same uh, issue, open issues or challenges as the balletting. So both these products by Roadmap confirm that there is quite a lot uh, to do still. And um, also the thematic papers are uh, published in the website of Roadmap, so you can very easily access them. They have a joy, and you can uh, enjoy, hopefully, the, the reading. Uh, the thematic papers uh, were placed under the task 3.2 that I, I led and I coordinated. And uh, they had, uh, um, a bit like the balletings, the, the scope was to select uh, three important relevant topics uh, that were actually listed in the proposal. There were several more, but thanks to the advice and the help of the advisory group, we uh, narrowed down the choice. Um, and the advisory group was actually very supported from the outline when we started to draft the outline of these thematic papers, one, two, and three. Uh, the advisory group was, in a way, called in in the process very early, uh, giving us uh, advice, uh, suggesting changes, um, giving us remarks and, and comments on how to improve the outline. Uh, then uh, Roadmap launched this, uh, so this call for uh, contributions, and we have uh, the, the, the chance to really find um, very good uh, experts uh, that actually were the, the ones writing uh, and, and digging into the, 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 the subject of each and every thematic paper. And uh, our role in, as a consortium was to follow this, uh, this process, to interact uh, with the experts and to report to some extent to the advisory group each time we had the chance to meet the advisory group. These are the three topics distillated from the long list the proposal had. We, uh, we thought that these were very interesting and uh, to some extent up-to-date topics that Roadmap was able with expertise inside and outside to, to, to fulfill. Uh, the first one looked at uh, good practices in multi-hazard risk scenarios. The second one, uh, good practices in risk and crisis communication, and they are both published. The third one is almost finished, uh, will be published by the end of the, of the project period. 
concerns building back better and leaving no one behind. And still, good practices is the main issue developed also there. Uh, if you compare the thematic papers and the ballettings, the, let's say that the structure is uh, quite different. They are, uh, in a way, bigger and longer documents, standalone documents, uh, with a wider target audience, uh, not only, in a way, uh, the scientific community or the decision maker, but also risk and crisis manager and civil protection uh, experts, and probably that has been the biggest challenge uh, in writing these papers, how to address this wide audience, and Julia uh, very well underlined earlier, uh, we speak different languages, we cannot deny this, how is possible to uh, speak to this wider audience in one document, and I think that challenge uh, to some extent lies still, still there. Uh, and then we, we we tried, as much as in the ballettings, to embrace this multi-risk perspective, this scenario-based approach, and we choose uh, to follow very much the Sendai framework as our guideline in uh, finding and categorizing the GPs in these three thematic papers. And this is a bit uh, the process that we follow. As you can see, it's quite similar to the process of the ballettings. It has been very much a desk research uh, led by the experts we hired. Um, the Sandai framework, again, was uh, central in this research, uh, both to, to actually search for these good practices, but also as methodology. And then the result was, again, to offer good practices. Um, and uh, to some extent, the first thematic paper set a bit the, 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 the way for the second and the third. Because in the um, uh, first thematic paper, uh, the experts uh, provided us with a definition of what good practices are. Um, and this definition uh, has been, in a way, repeated in the second and in the third. And then, um, the first thematic paper, again, set the standard because we decided, as I have just mentioned, to follow uh, the Sendai framework. And, uh, but while the first thematic paper was very much focused in finding and categorizing these um, good practices, basing this finding and categorization on priorities and targets, the second and the third actually uh, deepened this issue because they look very much into each and every article of the Sunday framework. I believe in it. This is a huge work that the expert deliver in an excellent way. And they try to extract so-called evaluation criteria. And using this evaluation criteria, the experts were able to look at good practices um, using, again, a bit the same process as the ballettings, good practices that were actually implemented or group practices that were research, where we could read uh, from uh, articles and publications that they actually function. And then uh, the, the experts looked at in, to what extent these good practices mirror this evaluation uh, criteria. And here again, uh, as, uh, as you can see, this is uh, a slide very much similar to the slide that Julia presented you, because in both cases, uh, even if, let's say, the two products uh, uh, were to some extent different, we find, we found again the same kind of challenges that are in a way, in a way listed uh, here, and Julia pinpointed very well already uh, these uh, open issues or rather challenges that need uh, to be in a way overcome, and I think that uh, this is the, the process that the roadmap had, had started uh, to some extent. Um, and uh, I, I just want to pinpoint the last one uh, that I have already said that the thematic paper uh, sought to reach a wider audience and uh, to, to, in a way, narrow this uh, uh, science policy uh, divide. And it has not been an easy endeavor, actually. Uh, to speak to such a varied uh, uh, audience. And also in this case, the advisory board was, uh, advisory group, sorry, was 
very uh, useful thanks to the mix of expertise. Uh, uh, it was very useful at pinpointing some weaknesses and some, some strengths in all these three uh, thematic papers as for this, uh, especially this final open, uh, open issue. Um, and we see as much as uh, before uh, for the balletings, also for the thematic papers, the importance of uh, uh, especially uh, defining a common terminology, uh, but uh, perhaps the main take uh, that I see also having been the coordinator of these three thematic papers is the importance of really establishing a sound scientific methodology to define what good practices are. Um, I personally think that the use of uh, the um, Sendai framework, especially in the way the Sendai framework has been refined in the second and third thematic paper, is, I think, the right way to go, but it's still a process. It's not an end, this one. It's perhaps just the beginning, and uh, actually, as, uh, as an academic, as a researcher, I find uh, myself uh, th this process very exciting and very, and very, and very interesting. Um, and then, uh, again, also, I think I want to stress just the last point. Um, these three thematic papers have been very much uh, research-driven. Uh, we were mainly academics uh, writing it and, uh, and, in, and uh, developing it, uh, them, sorry, even if we had, of course, the support of the experts for the advisory group. Uh, it could be, for example, very, very interesting uh, to uh, involve also in the writing phase uh, uh, those not belonging to the, to the academia, to, gi to give a more practical, in a way, um, uh, goal and purpose to these three, uh, three thematic, uh, thematic papers. And I think I hand here my short presentation. I thank you for the attention. And I, if I am allowed, I just want to reiterate my uh, acknowledgement and, and a deep thank to our experts, uh, Boris, Serena, Valentina, Francesco, and Piero. Uh, Frances uh, Francesca is unfortunately not, uh, not here. I, I want personally to thank you because you have uh, very graciously and uh, open-mindedly accepted all our comments, advices, uh, sometime I have to admit perhaps we have been a bit harsh in, in, in giving you feedback uh, and this has been a very exciting uh, actually collaboration and I personally want to thank you because uh, we have put a bit of pressure on you in some phases and you have responded in a very professional and uh, very nice and again open-mindedly way. So thank you again for your contribution. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, I would like to join uh, your thanks to uh, the expert of the thematic paper and all the experts that have been working on the different, uh, in the production of the different um, products of uh, this project. Without them, we wouldn't be here discussing something that we believe it's a good uh, outcome of a project. So. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned already, uh, as it was also mentioned by uh, Julia, uh, the involvement uh, of uh, uh, the decision making, a better involvement of decision makers, and that's something that looks to the future. And uh, I, I think that uh, now, with the next presentation from uh, uh, Daniela Di Bucci, uh, we will look a bit more into the future because we, we made a, uh, as a project uh, consortium a proposal. Uh, for a vision for the future. So, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, yes, uh, the, the last uh, 
kind of publication that we prepared is a vision paper, so something that we think could, could be uh, the address for the future. Uh, our vision paper uh, has um, the title of Shared Basic Elements for European Doctrine on this Disaster Risk and Crisis Management. And is organized, as you can see, in three parts. The first part is uh, the main document, uh, and we will deal in this presentation with this part, but uh, there's also a second part with the background information on which the first part relies, and the third part includes uh, keywords, acronyms, and so on. So we will go through the main document. Uh, uh, Maria already presented what we intend uh, as a, um, a doctrine in, uh, in this uh, project. So, uh, is a doctrine uh, on disaster risk and crisis management. And uh, the idea is that the vision paper, uh, starting from what are the other products that we have already presented and on the work done, should put the baseline for the creation of this doctrine. And uh, we would like also to uh, outline uh, research needs and possible actions that could be promoted in the future. So uh, it's an ambitious idea to call this a vision paper, but we consider this a, a sort of blueprint. And so we know that we need to uh, uh, do some more steps to achieve completely our results. And uh, the idea was also to provide the DG ECHO with uh, some recommendations uh, that are the result of the activities that we did in this one year and a half. And the overarching goal is at the bottom of this slide. We would like to help the knowledge network related activities that uh, DG ECHO and JRC are planning and implemented. implementing. Uh, some definitions. Uh, the content of our project stems from the concrete experience of those who work in the field of sea protection and have to make, as uh, our head of the department said to tomorrow, to, today, uh, have to make decisions every day in our field of disasters management. So we work at a different level of scales, local, national, international, and uh, dealing with the whole risk cycle. So not only emergency, but the, the management of prevention, preparedness, and emergency, and response, and overcoming. Uh, what we know is that decision-making activities, although characterized by different uh, uh, specificity elements that uh, are diverse in each, in each case, are often response to similar situations. So uh, we need to address similar changes, uh, challenges and it's important to share the understanding of different cases that may occur and all, uh, on, of the solutions that are already there that can be useful for all of us. So these solutions should be uh, identified and uh, we have to verify that uh, they are successfully adapted. We consider these good practices, as uh, you know, and uh, we know that these good practices benefit significantly from from the, the, the scientific knowledge. So, in the roadmap project, uh, we consider doctrine as a shared understanding of disaster management between decision makers and scientific actors. So, we started to work with these two communities, uh, civil protection decision makers and scientific, scientists and academics in, in general. Um, why we do this and for whom? Uh, we know that the mechanism is moving toward a shared approach to disasters management and crisis management. So looking uh, at a common vision of reference values and to the coordination of activities at different territorial level. And uh, we think that this approach, uh, the shared approach, is particularly important to better manage risks and crises in case they affect several countries, so at the European level, especially at the same time, and uh, especially to prevent and uh, to be prepared for multi-hazard multi risk disaster. Uh, I would like to underline that this project is specifically focused to, to the multi-hazard risk approach, so we do not deal with single risk. Also the bulletins that uh, Julia presented, each of them uh, was focused on uh, more than one risk. So the multi-risk is always uh, present in, uh, in our vision. 
As said, despite national differences, there are common traits in these activities and common uh, approaches uh, that can be highlighted that, that are already there among the participating states and uh, the member states of, of the European, and they emerge in, every, in our everyday experience. So uh, we think that the knowledge network could be the place, or is a place, that could support this approach, this collaborative approach, both from a conceptual point of view, we are discussing of the doctrine now, and also from a physical point of view, representing physically and virtually the place where we can meet and we can share uh, and we can comment uh, the, 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 the good practices and our experience. Um, we also think that the civil protection uh, doctrine can be built and nurtured by the stakeholders. So, uh, following a bottom-up approach that's part of the process as Maria presented before. Uh, who are the potential beneficiaries of this doctrine? First of all, we think that the two communities that work in this project are main beneficiaries, so scientists and academics for, from one side and decision makers for the other side. And of course, between them there are hybrid experts, so those people who favor the, the uh, interaction between, the, between these communities that are able to understand both languages and both the contents and needs. There are also other potential beneficiaries, of course, uh, professionals, mass media, judiciary, and of course, uh, at the end of the, 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 of the line, there are citizens. And I also think that all of them are part of the project. So they are not only passive beneficiaries, they are also part uh, in, the, in building this process. Of course, there are some challenges, as we know. We have to take into account them. Uh, as we already heard, we, know, we do not share a common language yet. And there are some countries where this, um, uh, um, uh, how can I say, uh, experience is already there. In Italy, we are working strongly on having a shared language among the two communities. And, but this is not uh, everywhere in place. And um, most of all, it's important to share a common vision of values and of objectives that still need to be uh, achieved. Um, so what we are doing, we are proposing this first version of a doctrine. There's a, a first step to overcome the challenges that are presented. Of course, we know that uh, we need a great deal of joint work to reach uh, this uh, shared understanding of disaster risk management, and uh, that uh, it has to be consistently implemented by all the actors involved. To do this, we know that we need uh, to, to, to do some steps. So we have a roadmap in, in, in the, for moving ahead the project roadmap. Uh, we think that the future uh, uh, perspective, uh, uh, the ultimate goal of our project should be the, the future release of the products that we are presenting to you uh, as a regular service within the knowledge network. So regular bulletins, uh, thematic papers in a um, regular uh, way of publication, the solutions explorer that's continuously updated and consulted. And uh, we think that's important to have this product supported by an expert group and, uh, with a forum uh, of uh, collaboration. And when we call the, uh, uh, talk about experts, we, we uh, talk about a community which includes our advisory group, uh, which includes the participants in the project. So it's a real community. Um, we listed the, some steps that could be, that are, we consider still necessary to achieve the final goal. I listed here, uh, go through them quickly. The first point is a more effective, we need a more effective organization of the advisory group's activities. What do we um, notice during this one, half, one year and a half is that it's not easy to keep continuously involved a community of experts. They start with uh, enthusiasm, but typically this enthusiasm go uh, to decline through time. 
and but it's important that they are with us. And if we, if we want to do this within the knowledge network, we have to keep the level uh, over a standard. So this is a, a, an issue that we have to uh, to try to manage. We are thinking some solutions, but there's work to be done on this. And then the a second point is the involvement of other actors. So we are scientists and decision makers, but, but we need to uh, um, widen, to broaden the, the community. Um, then um, to, to have a, a, an effective uh, functioning of the system, we need, if we need a large network, we would uh, have uh, uh, a dedicated writing area for the bulletins, for instance. And uh, we need to develop an editorial project for the, for the thematic papers. It should be a series of book, for instance, I don't know, something that's managed regularly. And uh, we need also the full implementation of the Solutions Explorer in the platform to consult, to collect, to make uh, this tool something that is uh, very effective and uh, uh, consulted. So after this uh, vision for the future in the short period, so what uh, we need to do in the next years, uh, the idea at the beginning of the project was also to provide the DG ECHO with some recommendations. Um, these recommendations, uh, we consider them as starting points for a reasoning, of course, not something that uh, should be done, but ideas that we have for you. And uh, these are summarized in a list. We have six recommendations, but you have to understand them that they are interlinked. They uh, have to be seen as activities that uh, have to be carried out in a synergic way. First, recomm first recommendation uh, deals with the importance of an integrated community of experts. Uh, we did a very fruitful and interesting experience with our advisory group. We will see their activity later with uh, Domingos. Uh, to compose this advisory group, we uh, discussed a lot on the selection criteria, and we identified some selection criteria, both for the scientists and academics and for the civil protection experts. The, um, designing the list uh, with the fields of expertise that we need to cover and with the different risks that we need to cover. And uh, for the decision making also the different levels of governance from the local level to the international level. Um, this is the first nucleus, but if we want to gradually broaden this community, we, uh, this gradually broadening needs an effort, a, a, re a really important organizational effort to design and, major, and manage these activities because of what I said before and because of uh, the, the problem of having a, a even more uh, um, broad community. If you, the community is very large, uh, the problem of how to manage to relate with them is important. Second recommendation deals with the need of a European Observatory of Good Practices. Uh, we think that a tool like the Solutions Explorer should be part of the knowledge network, but we are happy um, to know from what uh, our colleagues uh, Felix and Alexandra said this morning that this seems a shared vision of the idea. Um, we consider that this kind of tools, uh, a virtual place where the disaster risk management doctrines, so the shared understanding is built, and is built following a bottom-up approach to fill in uh, the good practice uh, in, in uh, the, the, the solutions explorer, and a, a top-down approach to govern, to have a governance of this tool. And uh, it is also a common reference point to, to store and to look for the good practices. Um, we think, in our experience, that uh, those who design, who implement, test, and use the practice are best placed to make an initial, initial assessment. So who will decide what a good practice is? Who use it? If we, we did something that was uh, successful, we can think that it's a good practice. So we are in the, the right position to present this good practice to the community, 
But of course, uh, we need a, a counterpart to, to see if these uh, good practice can be uh, replicable, can be exported, it's, it's uh, flexible enough. In any case, uh, the involvement of the community of practitioners is important and is of great value. Third, the counterpart of this is the need of national observatories. In our uh, perspective, we think that uh, um, the, our suggestion is that uh, uh, the collection of good practices should be promoted and supported in uh, EU member states and participant states. Uh, we think that the one possibility is to support with the, uh, this activity with some uh, financing tools that are already in place with this here. We, we, we have an example. Um, and that the European level should integrate these uh, national produ production and uh, in national levels. Uh, we have an experience in Italy that will be presented in the afternoon, so I don't go through this. Fourth recommendation, the involvement of other participants in the construction of the doctrine. So, um, wrote that, uh, uh, laid the foundation for the construction of this doctrine, but we need to deal with still numerous aspects. Among the, the actors that we think that we should involve there are the NGOs, the media, the industry, the citizens, and I, we, we think that DGA could, could can encourage and steer this part of the developments. We need this, the, 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 yes, you should steer this activity because we need an, a, an overarching governance uh, to have a, uh, the same perspective. Um, of course, these different communities have to be involved in parallel, but we have also to integrate them, and we have to think since the beginning on how to integrate them. Five, the, our recommendation is about the development of research based on multi hazard risk approach. This is a really important gap that we found. Uh, looking for good practices in the literature, we found that there's no research on this. It was very difficult to find. Claudia and um, Julia already said this. Uh, there is very few activities related to, to the scientific approach on, on good practices and multi-hazard risk approach. Uh, you can find some that deals with single hazard or single experience, one scenario, but this overall, overall uh, vision is very lacking. So um, we think that uh, the covering the, closing this gap could be pursued by DGECO, in part that, um, directing the research funding this, on this topic, but uh, also if it is possible, we discussed about this yesterday, I encourage the other directorate general to do this, to issue calls uh, on, on this topic. So uh, this is a suggestion of, of a general uh, research perspective that could be declined in possible topics like multi-hazard risk models, cascade effects, integration of social vulnerability, and so on. There are several possibilities to approach this uh, topic. Six and last uh, deals with the high level civil protection education and training because uh, each of our countries has a high level uh, education institution, institution which provide the service of uh, training future researchers and professionals, very specialized. Um, as this professional in the future will work with their, uh, within the risk cycle, they should be trained to work as a part of a team, a European team uh, in general, with a general perspective. So it's needed a common high-level education path, uh, both for uh, civil protection decision makers and for researchers. And uh, we think that uh, this common path should be developed at uh, the European level uh, to guarantee some common, commonality in a syllabus, the shared understanding of the doctrine, um, uh, a shared vocabulary, uh, the exchange of education and experiences. So a focus on uh, this topic should be um, done. So to conclude, 
some final remarks. We think that the, the synergy collaboration that uh, the project uh, had with uh, DGEC and JRC, we really worked together. And this has proven to be a good experience. Uh, it worked effectively. So we consider this experience uh, an, uh, that we gained uh, an added value. And uh, we are very happy. We would like to, to, to thank DGECO and, and the collaboration with GRC for the opportunity to work on these topics. And uh, of course, we would like to continue to collaborate with you uh, after, also after the end of this project. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, and uh, um, thanks to all, again to all the participants in the project that uh, produced this uh, vision paper that we hope it will be helpful also for the discussion of this afternoon and for the future of the Knowledge Network. Uh, now uh, I'm going to call uh, Domingo uh, Xavier Viegas uh, uh, to present us the advisory uh, group that was uh, the, uh, mentioned already several times. Uh, so we will have uh, a, first a presentation and then a bit of discussion on this. So uh, it's my pleasure to leave you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here and at this moment to give you a brief presentation of the activities of the advisory group. So far, we have been uh, hearing about activities or products of the project. Now we are going to uh, learn a bit about one of the bodies of the project, although there were persons outside the project, but they were uh, like us working in it. Um, let me say a word of presentation of myself. I am a mechanical engineer. I am work, I'm a researcher, so I've come from the scientific community. I work in forest fires for many years. And uh, uh, when I accepted to participate, I was invited uh, by Andrea to participate in this project. Uh, it was a bit of a challenge for me. I was a bit outside of this multi-risk perspective of this engagement of um, uh, people of different backgrounds and uh, especially thinking about uh, doctrine or uh, guidelines in such a short time, I thought it was uh, a very difficult task and it, it was. But I, I am quite uh, happy to see how uh, with the hard work of this team and with the guidance of the people that led the different activities that we are seeing how we uh, managed to, uh, I say, uh, uh, achieve uh, very good results. Well, this was uh, possibly the perspective of the colleagues of the persons of the advisory group whom we invited to uh, participate in the project as our um, advisors, of course. Uh, the advisory group, it was mentioned uh, several times because it was, uh, during, from the beginning, it was a very essential part of the project and that of our activities. We designed it to be uh, formed by selected experts from scientific and the operational uh, part and covering, if possible, different risks and uh, different phases of the, this uh, disaster risk management cycle. Uh, also, we wanted to cover different countries and uh, eventually different institutions and networks for this purpose. <coughs> The objectives were to support and advise the consortium uh, in its activities and provide a further background information and experts' opinion. We knew that inside the project we had already expertise, of course, we had uh, uh, 
different institutions, but we wanted to broaden it and to get the support of this group. Uh, this table was already shown by Maria, uh, and unfortunately in her slide it was not very clear, but you can see here the names of the persons that, whom we invited from the uh, different backgrounds in science and also in uh, uh, operational institutions from different uh, countries. Um, these people accepted uh, this role and we had nothing to offer them uh, besides meetings, more work and uh, also some guidance to read some papers. Uh, and, 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 but they accepted it and they participated in the project in, in the uh, uh, meetings very generously and their uh, feedback was very positive for us. So we are very thankful for, to all of them uh, for what they uh, gave us. I will not uh, go, let's say, uh, more in detail in the uh, names or in the purpose of each one, but uh, you will recognize that we covered quite a wide uh, range of, of persons and uh, uh, activities. <coughs> the role of the advisory group was, was to um, advise us in the activities, namely in this collection of uh, good practices and the systematization of them, and to give support to critical review of the documents that we produced and also of the solutions that were already identified in different EU countries and that we were looking also elsewhere. And to give the selection, uh, support on the selection of topics in the preparation of the thematic papers. This was already mentioned too by uh, Claudia uh, before, but I'll come back to this. <coughs> and at the same time, also the thematic and vision papers that we are uh, uh, concluding now, they were um, also supported by the, uh, this uh, uh, advisory group. And uh, uh, to facilitate the networking activities with a broader community of experts and practitioners because we wanted to reach a wider audience. Um, we had uh, this calendar of meetings um, in the short time uh, uh, or period of time of the project. We could not have many more, and um, um, these were the uh, main topics of each one of these uh, uh, meetings. And I, uh, I can tell you, it was already stressed, but I can tell you that these meetings were, were very important, uh, even to guide the project from the beginning. Um, as an example, I show you this uh, was the agenda that we had prepared for the first meeting. And as you can see, it was very crowded. We had uh, uh, listed lots of to topics and, and uh, uh, subjects to deal in the, in the meeting. But from the beginning of the meeting, uh, with the interaction of the advisory groups, we realized that something was not going in the right direction. So we were several uh, points were, were raised by our advisors, and we immediately identified things that we had to change. To give you an example, uh, in the proposal we called uh, best practices, and we were called the attention that that was not correct. We should at most consider good practices, because best practices, good, uh, good practices are difficult to find, but the best ones are, I think, possible. So that's, that made a change in our uh, language and also different other uh, guidelines that uh, councils that were given in this meeting, they oriented it as very much, even the, the list of thematic papers that we had, that was quite long as was mentioned, we shortened it, we focused in uh, some more specific and more addressed topics. So <coughs> the second meeting was uh, um, already uh, on the, the uh, concept of the thematic paper one based on the, on the ideas that we brought from the first meeting and uh, also how we would uh, guide uh, the contents of thematic paper two and three. And uh, uh, the third meeting was um, uh, to present uh, already what was done in thematic paper one and uh, to uh, discuss uh, the preparation of thematic papers two and three uh, that were, uh, were proposed there. And <coughs> the advisory group members also gave us uh, good ideas to organize the webinars, and they even participated in the webinars and contributed to them um, um, very, very uh, efficiently. Um, 
the, the fourth meeting that we uh, organized in, with the advisory group was, again, to, in this case, to discuss the thematic paper three and to present the solution explorer and the first versions of the vision paper that was uh, then being uh, prepared. So this was what um, was uh, the content of the fourth meeting uh, of the advisory group. Uh, in one document of the project, it is a deliverable uh, to two, we summarize the activities of the advisory group. So those of you that want to have more details on the activities, on the meetings, on the participation and the contents, you please can follow them. But I would like to, to say how important it was to have the activity of this advisory group. Um, to summarize, I think they provided us great insights and uh, helped do the, uh, also the revision of the thematic and vision papers. Uh, so the contents of these thematic papers uh, are, as, as I suppose I explained, uh, very much, were very much guided. Of course, we had some ideas at the beginning, but the, the, our uh, line, our path was somewhat corrected by the, the inter intervention of the advisory group. Uh, the meetings that we had were very fruitful. Uh, I would say that they were well participated. Members of the advisory group, of course, they could not attend all of the meetings, but some of them attended. And they had the uh, intervention and, uh, from their, their sides, from science, from, uh, from operations, and uh, uh, they, uh, let's say, helped to uh, uh, converge in a common language. Um, there was an interesting approach to identify relevant topics as well, gaps, and that identify good practices. And this was something that was transversal to the project and uh, will uh, be also presented in the um, um, uh, Solution Explorer. Uh, the advisory group contributed to the improvement of all road map activities and outcomes. So I am very, uh, in the name of the project, uh, I am uh, grateful. My team was responsible of managing this advisory group, and uh, we are um, very thankful for the, the, the contribution of this uh, group of people. And I think this is an example of what can be uh, the layout of these observatories, of these uh, uh, groups of uh, experts that are uh, available to work together at the European community. In this case, it was uh, at an European uh, level, at a project level, but it can be uh, at a wider level and higher level uh, to create this uh, support to the activities and to create this common language between uh, ourselves scientists and also the uh, operational people uh, that is necessary. And uh, in this project I found that in uh, this very challenging environment of multi-risk because uh, being uh, scientists in one risk, specific risk, sometimes we are not very exposed, we are not very used to speak about other risks and also with this uh, common language with the operation for people. And that's all for my part for this presentation. And uh, um, I was not asking for the applause, I was asking <laughs> for permission to if we, we should continue with the conversation yeah. with them. Do we want to invite the yes. colleagues in the table? So Chris, Gerard, uh, Lucia, you like to come here and, uh, for the, this exchange? Ian is also online. Oh, I, yeah. I, uh, my, my suggestion, I, I don't know if uh, Andrea, you agree, um, if we could provide, uh, if we could ask our uh, colleagues from the advisory group if they want to give their impression, their feedback about the project, how... You, you can have a seat. Yeah. And this includes also... I. I ask you if you want to give your impression about 
how was your hold in the project and how did you see the the advance of the activities and the, how we are, we are getting <coughs> well uh, can everybody hear me so yeah uh, i'm lucia castro herrera one of the members of this advisory group um, at the beginning, I wasn't really sure why I was called in into, into, the, into this team, and I, I arrived to the first meeting very clueless. Uh, but later, I realized that it was a really nice arena for me to both um, give feedback and, and knowledge wearing both of my hats. Right now I'm, uh, I'm an academic, but before I was a practitioner and I, I find that this project was like a really, or is a really nice combination of the two. So uh, what was a thing full of confusion at the beginning became a very rewarding task of reviewing the papers, giving advice, and I really appreciated being uh, involved from the beginning into like uh, defining the table of contents, defining the thematic areas. That for me, um, so that, um, yeah, the experts don't waste time creating things. So that later we say like, yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, for example, that part of best practices, yeah, well, best practices are not really the best. Maybe they are good enough. So yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Here we are. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, good morning from my side also. My, my name is Gerhard Wotawa. I'm from the Meteorological and Geophysical Service of uh, Austria. Um, I um, uh, was involved in this, in this activity uh, uh, because uh, our institute is part of an um, uh, international uh, EU-level um, um, service that is called Aristotle, uh, that um, is the, the European Natural Hazard Scientific Partnership. So we are uh, providing uh, advice to the to the European Commission and especially the the ERCC, the European Emergency Response Coordination Center, uh, in the event of a natural uh, hazard in in various uh, um, hazard groups like in, in earthquakes and in in uh, weather related hazards, in volcanic eruptions, in uh, flooding and in in forest fires, to name the uh, the important ones and. Um, uh, this task is actually um, uh, also um, like a very operational task because we provide this advice not uh, within a week or two, but really within uh, the first few hours uh, after a disaster strike. So for us, um, a project like um, Roadmap is, uh, I think, is very is very important initiative. Yeah, we we know that uh, scientific expertise is uh, is needed during a disaster, yeah. But we also know how complex it is. No, I mean, and we have heard today already that um, like uh, there needs to be um, a kind of harmonization uh, and a kind of um, I mean, all the countries are different. Yeah, uh, there are different laws in place, there are different practices in place. Yeah, um, uh, but nothing creates more confusion than different scientific opinions. No, and there. Are, as we have learned also during the COVID crisis, there are as many opinions as there are scientists on, uh, on, this, on this planet in a way, yeah? which is natural because this is our methods to work. No? We, uh, our methods to work is actually um, uh, to question data we have yeah? and, and to, to create new insights on that. No? Uh, but this is very difficult in the first three hours. No? So, so very important, I think, um, and that's also one of the key elements here is, is actually the, the exchange uh, in good times between the experts, no, not during the crisis, but in good times, and uh, the exchange also between the disciplines yeah, and um, uh, uh, between uh, the experts and also the practitioners. Yeah, and, and I think this has to be done. Yeah. And um, um, my impression from the roadmap project was that this is a very good step forward, also that um, uh, what has been worked out. Of course, it's not the end of the road in a way because this cannot be expected like a final answer to, to a complex question. But it's, I think it's a very good uh, point to uh, be made. And so I was very happy to, to join this, this project. And I think the results were very useful also for, um, uh, for in, in, in practical terms. And I'm, I hope really and um, that this, this um, is not the end of the story, but this is followed up. Uh, and, and is also used in the future uh, to, to, 
to get the better uh, services, also uh, continuous improved services for the European citizens. Yeah? Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Christopher Burton. Uh, I'm uh, essentially a professor of geographic information science, or GIS, at the University of Connecticut. Uh, before coming to the University of Connecticut, I was in this country, in Pavia, Italy, working for the Global Earthquake Model. And what I was doing for, for GEM is essentially trying to integrate the more <coughs> social type of aspects of risk with the more civil engineering based uh, probabilistic earthquake models. So I looked at aspects of social vulnerability and aspects of resilience and in trying to, to measure that. Um, in terms of the roadmap project, I was didn't I missed out on some of the first initial meetings simply because I had COVID and I was actually really really sick, so I got to experience uh, the really bad end of COVID-19, but of course recovered from that. Uh, but I was still able to to take part in in some of the paper development. And one of the things I really appreciated about this project is it started with some lessons I learned in, in, in GEM right away. Is that if we're we're looking at risk, in in many ways it's context specific. And, and this is what came out in, in some of the discussions and talks we've had so far, is what makes people vulnerable or, or resilient to drought, for example, or wildfire, is gonna be potentially very different from earthquakes. And, and so perhaps this is a good way of, of thinking about that context. Uh, also, the interaction between stakeholders, practitioners, and, and academics. One of the things I learned working in GEM right away, coming directly from graduate school is my first job and a great way to, to start my career, in that definitely learned right away that what I was thinking as an academic wasn't necessarily the same thing that the practitioners wanted. So I had all different types of ideas for building social vulnerability models and applying these all over the world, and, and the practitioners were like, wait, slow down a little bit. Uh, you need to be thinking about things like culture and how do you measure culture? How do you measure the ability to, to make decisions? And so perhaps a, a new way of thinking about things. And that got me thinking about, okay, integrating top-down type of index-based approaches with bottom-up working with stakeholder type of approaches such as scorecards. And it's another thing that's been brought out uh, in this project, which is uh, another thing that I think is a very good way to, to move forward. I think that's it. <laughs> I don't know if Ian is with us. Pardon? Um, if you allow me, I would like to ask Ian if he wants also to. He's online. I don't know if Ian is listening to us. Is there a communication with Ian? Can he speak? Ian. Ian, can you hear us? Could you open your mic and talk? No. Sally, okay. Maybe you okay. ask your question, Daniela. You wanted to ask. Uh, yes, I have a question for all of, uh, of you because uh, as you have seen in my presentation, we are thinking to develop better uh, a, a community which includes uh, uh, experts, and you are the first nucleus of such a community uh, uh, along with us. So uh, you know, sorry, you know better than us uh, which were the difficulties that you uh, faced being part of our advisory group, and how can we? Mm, upgrade and, and make uh, your collaboration more effective and uh, maintain it through time because this is one of the problems that we had. We, we lose uh, attention, we have a lot of things to do, 
So if you want to have a, a group of experts like you with us in, in the years, let's say, from your point of view, which should be the, the issues that we have to address, which are the challenges that we have to, to overcome. I think for us, uh, I mean, I'm, I speak now for, for, for all of us, um, uh, in, in, in the sense it, it was the, the major challenge was of course also COVID yeah, because there was so many, uh, uh, so not many opportunities to have meetings really on that one. But I, I fully understand the, uh, the, the issue to, to maintain such a, such a, uh, such a group. Yeah. I mean, um, very important is I, I think to, uh, to define like what what input you really want, yeah, and how you want it, and and uh, at what frequency you want that, and I think if that is well defined, um, and uh, there are opportunities actually to um, um, in, in in the sense of organized meetings and structured dialogue, I think that that could be, that could work in the future. I believe, yeah. Um, it is, um, I mean, um, also in Aristotle, we have similar problems, to be honest, to maintain expert groups and, and to maintain uh, advisory groups. Yeah. Um, I, I think it is possible, but it needs some, some effort from both sides, I believe. Yeah. And, and, uh, but um, my, my feeling was, uh, as, a, as a, just an expert here, that, that um, you tried hard to integrate also in, in, the, in the meetings and to, um, yeah, to start this. And the times were not as easy as it could be. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, I will, I will reiterate uh, the point of uh, having real uh, clear instructions of what the role is and what do you want from the expert group? Because uh, we can give advice on anything and everything, uh, especially when, uh, when now, now I'm taking my practitioner hat, when someone is a practitioner, like you are not just, you don't have a narrow focus in disaster risk management. You take a wider approach throughout the entire di disaster uh, management life cycle. So I, I feel like if I have a concrete set of requirements and a concrete set of tasks, that makes it a lot easier. And I personally, I stayed in the group because this is a, a subject that is dear to my heart and I, and I felt like I could contribute. And I actually thought that my time was worth investing here. So I think that's, that's what you want to achieve is that, that people kind of like want to be in it. In, like, without sounding too poetic, like be inspired um, into like uh, collaborating and giving feedback. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I can point out is, and, and this goes basically kind of into you, to your comments, is utilizing that vision paper. Uh, the vision paper is very nice and, and it, it, it kind of maps out a way forward and perhaps that can transcend into more products, uh, more projects that keep this one sustainable because it's being built on uh, the roadmap project in general. And of course, that'll, you'll still have a need for, for an advisory board and perhaps the same advisory board. Uh, another one, and this is maybe an impossible task, a uh, bigger picture task, and I'm not quite sure if this applies to, to every country within Europe, but it certainly applies within the U.S., is to try the best we can to, to break down some of these barriers in academia, academia, and one of them is a problem in academia itself where oftentimes working with practitioners isn't necessarily looked at is, is high in, in terms of some of the research that happens. So we're encouraged to publish in high-level disciplinary journals that no practitioner is going to read because they don't want to subscribe to the annals of the Association of American Geographers just to get a paper and then so or read a paper and so perhaps it's uh, another way to to move forward but also a more difficult bigger picture one uh, but I think starting with that vision paper would be a, a great one um. yeah I just wanted to make a comment, and then please, uh, can you uh, can you come uh, to the mic uh, to ask your question? Or, okay, as you as you uh, get to the mic, I, I just wanted to make a comment um, just after this roundtable the, about the question uh, from Daniela. 
um, because we experienced, uh, we, we need to be honest, at the, at the beginning, the first meeting, as Lucia was recalling, was uh, kind of dramatic because the, uh, we met each other online and uh, uh, all of you said, uh, we don't understand exactly the question, maybe the question is too wide. Um, I had the feeling uh, that, that this was the problem. Now your comments are confirming this. And so uh, f to me, the lesson learned is from one side uh, uh, to maybe uh, agree on uh, a short statement about the role of the uh, advisory group, because this was something that uh, all of you asked. And uh, also my um, feeling is that um, all of us are very busy. Um, so I think on one side, maybe uh, we should be uh, more uh, able to ask specific questions or clarify exactly the contributions. But on the other side, I think that uh, one uh, trick could be to have a, um, a set of periodic meetings, maybe fixed uh, just uh, in advance. Because my feeling is that when we stay together a, around a, a, a real problem, then the interaction starts. And maybe if um, I saw that uh, sometimes you had the feeling to answer to a specific question, but you gave us a more wide response. So uh, I think we should be able to find uh, uh, real uh, uh, problems, real uh, occasions, and probably the meetings, uh, possibly uh, physical meetings could be an occasion. So on one side, we should uh, probably plan in advance to avoid the conflict with the agenda of each of us. Um, so uh, be, a, be noticed that maybe we have three meetings per year, for example, and then uh, set uh, topics so that uh, any of you can have time and uh, bring uh, maybe experiences and uh, starting from a real story build up uh, discussions like this. You remember, we had these online, which are art online, but I remember that after the interaction became uh, really uh, soft and, and easy. So I think we should work on this experience uh, along this path. Now we have a question. Yeah, test, test, yeah, they go. Um, the question. Um, so that kind of adds to, to what you just proposed. And the question is towards the advisory board when it comes to expanding on experts. And this was something that was addressed in the, um, in the visions now. So do you see any more incentives that the project can offer or future projects can offer apart from that sparking curiosity and being a part of this um, that you can see like, like creating a win-win situation so as to recruit experts that do not have that much of time as you know you for yourselves. Do you see any, any f ki ki things that might spark interest um, in terms of an incentive? Maybe also these suggestions having like fixed spots where there's cl clearly allocated time for, for the project. Is there anything that you can think of the top of your head that might like interest people from your field in terms of an incentive? Uh, in the pro just yesterday we submitted uh, uh, a yeah just yesterday we submitted a proposal for a, a new project that's on the way of roadmap and in, inside we exactly proposed to introduce some kind of incentives of course in, in you should intend it in a, in a higher level or a way of thinking so uh, some way that uh, for 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 the for our uh, advisory group is important uh, and motivates them to be with us and not necessarily an incentive in ten intending money for instance not at all but yes because uh, incentives work in uh, from a, a a social point of view uh, people uh, appreciate to be um, incentivated with some in some way you appreciate their contribution not only giving uh, t telling them that thank you very much but also involving in a way that is in incentivating for them so we are thinking about this but I don't know if this idea 
is in the uh, in the mind of uh, DG Eco and JRC in, in a perspective on, on how to build the, the calls in, in the sense that you have uh, um, advisory groups, uh, communities that in some way find an incentive to be part of the community. This is a, a wider perspective. We have this point in, uh, in our project, but it's a small part. But we think that incentivating the community to be part of the project is uh, one of the main uh, issues that uh, we have to uh, address in the knowledge network, for instance. Let's let's uh, listen from the, the. Do you have any other ideas? Well, like concrete ideas, it depends on where you come from. So, um, and I was actually thinking about this because I recently did a workshop uh, with practitioners, and I and I was like, well, my my objective was to pick their brains, literally. But I also started to think like, okay, what is in it for them? And that's how we make decisions. What is in it for me? So now, like, if it is in, a, in, a, in the academic field, it's a little bit easier because it's like, well, maybe the opportunity to co-publish or uh, the opportunity to increase your network into, like, for future works and, or the opportunity to get data, which is, uh, which is a gold for, for academics. Um, so, as, as far as <coughs> the practitioner perspective, like what is in it for, for it is, uh, uh, for you, is, uh, it's kind of like having that generalized knowledge and the opportunity to attend to forums like this and discuss common themes. I think that would be, um, that would be really appreciated and that will uh, keep people in, in the project. And also, um, instead of like long presentations, at, le at least this worked in my workshop recently, I had hands-on uh, sessions where we did a lot of brainstorming and keeping like the audience active. And I think that that keeps people coming. That's uh, just my two cents. Yeah, I think that um this off. Uh, I think the, the most important incentive for, for scientists is, is, is certainly networking and data. No, I mean that's that's uh, um, uh, that's the reason why we get together all the time at conferences and so on. And, and in this field, of course, I mean if you if you uh, I mean you, you deal with different disciplines, but you also deal with uh, technical people, but you also deal with people who are already on the management level more or less. So, so you have to be clear with your. Um, whom do you want, what do you want, and uh, uh, what, what do you expect? I think that's uh, very important. Uh, uh, if you expect more like the, this uh, operational people or people who um, uh, are in, in the management part, I mean, to institutionalize uh, things and to kind of um, um, structure this dialogue would be very important, I think. Yeah, then then uh, everything goes, goes well. Uh, uh, so, um, and at, at the beginning of, like at the first meeting, maybe we didn't know exactly what, what, uh, what was the expectation. I think this was much better in, in, the, in the other phase and then um, uh, in, the, in the final phase. So, so basically, I think you learned a lot, we learned a lot there, yeah, and you can build up on that. No? That's important. I think uh, another thing is, is something that you're already doing in, in keeping it multidisciplinary uh, because that will be attractive to, to certain scientists uh, like myself, for example. Um, and, and so having the ability to, to interact with people from other disciplines to learn because risk is a multidimensional, multidisciplinary thing and to be able to look at it holistically, uh, we, we need to be all together in the same room. And so if that can be stressed, it'll probably attract uh, other scientists uh, as well. Um, Daniela raised the, the question about the relevance of these type of advisory groups and uh, if there is any perspective from the DG ECO or from GRC to interact and to support these type of initiatives in the projects. Can we hear something from you? Well, for us, it, was, it would be very useful to be able to collaborate in the framework of the science pillar 
for thematic groups, as I, as I said. We want to establish also thematic groups working constantly, and therefore that for us is the formula which would be more interesting to, to keep the collaboration and to have it going. I can't give you an answer really from, from uh, the Joico's perspective. I, I see obviously, uh, like everybody else in the room, the case and the, the, the logic of uh, continuing this. Uh, I Bon. So I think like everybody else in the room, uh, there's an obvious case, I mean, th th we, we all understand that, only that I do not have the answer for you uh, right away to see how this can be integrated in the, in, in the, in, um, in the architecture of the uh, of the knowledge network and uh, uh, so this for me is really food for thought and reflection and to see how we can do that this is why I'm here to listen I don't have the answer I uh, just you know maybe maybe sometimes there's uh, the, the Commission is very small we we have very very little staff very little money and uh, we we need to see how we you know we can manage all those processes at the same time it's not easy uh, just uh, to say that, but um, but I I I hear you, and we need to think about it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I um, uh, I I make a, maybe a, another remark. Uh, I was l listening to you. I think uh, another possibility to improve uh, this participation uh, of the um, members of the uh, advisory board could also be to uh, create a stronger link with the young people helping to the products of the project because uh, uh, Claudia was uh, acknowledging the, our, our colleagues, young colleagues that have worked on the thematic papers. Um, so um, I was uh, thinking that probably um, uh, we can uh, even um, create a, a more strong link with the advisory group and uh, uh, young, uh, uh, young people involved in, in these activities because uh, my feeling was, this, it was that sometimes um, the, the members that we lost after the first meeting they were a little bit scared about the uh, the load of work that uh, was for them. So maybe uh, having a people that uh, uh, elaborate some ideas, maybe just after an interview with uh, with each of you on some topics, could facilitate probably the the work. Because I think we should uh, involve the experts, but I know that each of us uh, is missing emails or has no time, uh, no extra time for this. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as Gerard said, I think uh, all of you um, uh, do not need an incentive rather than understand that you are doing something useful. Um, you survived because you, you had this feeling. We failed with some of them in the first, after the first meeting probably to uh, to share this type of uh, idea and uh, to me the, sa the challenge is uh, to the next time to be able to keep the group uh, uh, motivated and to find all the, these uh, possible uh, solutions in order to to keep the, the, the group alive so to me I'm convinced having uh, some dates for meetings um, link the, the more expert people with maybe young people that uh, can do some groundwork and um, probably um, using this, this planning of meetings in order to allow the members of the advisory group to have occasion for sharing uh, experiences. Um, I think that uh, another thing that uh, could be necessary would be also to involve uh, during these meetings, maybe also um, 
decision makers uh, or other uh, experts uh, uh, on a local level. Daniela had in uh, her presentation uh, national and local. So, for example, even organize meetings where we listen experience from uh, representative of local uh, civil protections or um, selecting time-by-time uh, -time experts that maybe are not in advisory board, but maybe they can bring a, a single experience. So create, creating something dynamic, because uh, as uh, some of you said, uh, for scientists, but in general, for all of us, the sharing of information, the data, uh, is uh, interesting. So we should try to, to keep this also dynamic and uh, light in terms of uh, workload. This was my, my feeling. So we are approaching now lunch time. If there is no other question, I think we can uh, go out. Giovanni made sure that wind now is quiet, it seems. So, so we can go for lunch. <laughs>